headphones up, turn them way up. What's going on, everybody? It's me, Rich, and I'm back with another episode of VTC 2.0, Behind the Counter 2.0. This is episode 23. Thank you very much for stopping by, and thank you to all my new subscribers who have hit that subscribe button. Very cool. This week, our guest is Charlie McCracken. He's on AP Bio. He is on the show as Coach Novak. He is a writer on the show. He is a funny dude. I discovered him through listening to Hello from the Magic Tavern, which is one of my favorite podcasts. He plays Spintax the Green on Hello from the Magic Tavern. Go check that out, too. Check out AP Bio. And you know what? Check out this interview. All right, guys. Welcome to the show. Charlie McCracken. Charlie, how are you today? Good. Thanks for having me, Rich. Dude, thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. I've been following your work for quite a few years. Um, namely, discovered you on Hello from the Magic Tavern playing Spintax. And then that kind of rolled into AP Bio, which uh, I believe season four just started a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Came out September 2nd. All, uh, eight, uh, all eight episodes out on Peacock. That's awesome. It's you know what? Uh, I've I've had Peacock for a little bit, uh, mainly because uh, I'm a wrestling fan. So I transferred my the WWE network onto the Peacock stuff. Yes. But I've been making like these discoveries of like, oh, this show's cool. This show's cool. This movie's on here. This movie's on here. Um, and AP Bio is one of those shows that like I I really enjoy. Um, and it's like it has it, it's so quirky that I feel like it's still kind of like under the radar in a weird way, even with like the tremendous cast it has. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I think that quirkiness is really what we leaned into when we transitioned from network, you know, broadcast television on NBC mm -hmm. to Peacock, we were able to be, uh, now that we were streaming, we were able to be about 10% weirder. Michael Bryan, the creator of the show used to say when we were in that season three writer's room, uh, to sort of push it a little bit farther uh -huh. than we were able to before. But that's got to make it more fun. Um, you're one of the writers on the show too, right? That's right. Yeah. So that whole process has to be a lot more fun for you as opposed to like, I guess, being chewed out by standards and practices. Am I <laughs> yeah, right about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a lot less of that than uh, we ever thought, even with, uh, with NBC when we were broadcast. But um, basically, there were just weird combinations of words. You couldn't say Jesus Christ together. There's just a few oh, little man. bumps, uh, aside from the big swear words. But <laughs> mostly it was, you know, we thought we'd get pushed back on that season one episode mm -hmm. uh, titled Rosemary's Boyfriend, where Jack drowns all the uh, babies, uh -huh. all the, uh, robotic uh, health babies. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, they never said a peep about it. <laughs> I, you know, that's so fascinating. I think at this point, it's like, it's almost like an anything goes. I feel like as a fan of like, just like quirky humor and comedy and improv and all that stuff. I feel like networks and production companies kind of almost taken like an anything goes approach now, where it's like, as long as it's not too offensive, you can do whatever you want. Right. It seems like with the, the so many different shows and so much content, as long as they are staying true and talking to their audience the the powers that be will sort of let them do that um how does that make you feel as a writer and performer um good we like the freedom of being on peacock when we first started you know we were the first uh technically the first peacock original series uh -huh. and peacock was still being built when we went into that season three writers room so for a while we didn't have a lot of feedback like the people who we needed to uh get notes from were still being put into place so mm -hmm. we had free reign for for a good little bit did you originally start uh as like a writer before pre-production pre and then were offered the role of coach novak like how did that work well, so Mike O'Brien, the creator of the show, uh, mm -hmm. is an old friend of mine from Chicago. We both mm -hmm. started comedy in Chicago about the same time. Uh, I moved from northern Wisconsin, and he came from the Toledo area where AP mm -hmm. Bio was set. And uh, we played together on a, an improv team there called The Reckoning for uh -huh. uh, the theater uh, IO in Chicago. And uh, from there, you know, we played for like 20 years together and we both moved wow. out to LA around the same time. He of course went and did Saturday Night Live, mm -hmm. uh, but we both ended up in LA and uh, he was developing this, uh, this pilot for AP Bio. Uh, he, he gave me an early look at the script uh, just to get some notes and, uh, and some thoughts on that. And then when it was going to the network table read, the he just brought a bunch of us in a bunch of his friends from comedy to come in and read mm -hmm. uncasted character voices uh and i did dan decker uh who was relayer cast of course uh, mm -hmm. and i did coach in that table read and i got uh enough laughs at that table read uh 
uh, that the head of NBC at the time was like, cast that guy as the coach. So they put me in the pilot uh, mm -hmm. from there. And then once I went to series, they staffed me as a writer. Oh, that's cool. So like, it's yeah. kind of like, it's double duty basically, but Absolutely. you know, uh, it seems like a lot of fun. How long have you been like, you, so you come from like an improv background. That's right. Um, how long have you been doing like the improv? Cause I, I find improv very fascinating. You know, it's very like, just like the comedic aspect of it. I, I feel like it's a little indefinable. And then, you know, if I talk to somebody and I'm like, oh, like you should check out these improv guys. They're like, what's improv, you know? Sure. Uh, well, in a very basic format, you know, it's just unscripted comedy, right? It's paying attention to mm -hmm. patterns and being able to perform extemporaneously. But uh, yeah, I started in uh, 2000. I moved from northern Wisconsin down mm -hmm. to Chicago. Uh, I dropped out of college a semester before graduation mm -hmm. uh, because I was uh, sort of drinking myself uh, into my sofa and uh, <laughs> just watching, you know, yeah. VHS tapes of uh, SNL and uh, uh and uh, going to like local comedy nights and i was like i can either just continue to drink myself to death mm -hmm. uh, or i can go and learn how to do this thing that i'm obsessed with uh, and i knew that improv and second city was a route that a lot of snl cast members had been through before uh, and i heard about second city from a friend and i ended up moving with that friend down to chicago mm -hmm. uh, and started training down there in 2000. what what was the transition from like where are you from like rural wisconsin or like i'm from small yeah. town it's a very dairy farming community it's a yeah. town called stanley wisconsin population 2101 wow. when i lived there and uh yeah it was very it was big uh, it was a lot of culture shock for me to move to chicago uh it took me a year to ride the train i believe oh, wow. you know i was not into it i just drove everywhere i went and looked for parking <laughs> yeah and uh, there's zero parking in chicago <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> I find I find that so fascinating. Like I'm a, a native New Yorker and I love traveling the country. My wife and I just came back from a drive from New York to Cleveland to Chicago and back. And my impression of Chicago has always been like, this is the New York that could have been, <laughs> you know, where like it's clean. It's a very walkable. Everybody seems very nice. Um, how was that? And this is for you, this is early 2000s, right? That's right. So yeah. how is, how is that scene and transition for you? Like you said, moving from rural Wisconsin into like a, a major city, you know, like Chicago. For the first couple of years, I think I felt like I was living in a movie because okay. I had never, I had never really even spent time in a major like urban environment in my life. Mm -hmm. The biggest places I'd ever really been were like, you know, a couple hundred thousand people. And so just, to, or like to Minneapolis, I guess we'd go to Minneapolis sometimes. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, so it was uh, bizarre. And I would be like, oh, I'm walking around, look at these big buildings. I was a total tourist the whole time I was there. Yeah. Uh, and I really just went to, you know, three places. I barely explored the city. I went to the Improv Olympic. I went mm. to Second City. I went to a lot of bars and a grocery store. And that was <laughs> it. And like yeah, uh, yeah. And the comic book stores uh, as well. But uh, uh, and that was my entire life for a few years until I met my wife uh, there, who is also a comedian, uh, Rebecca Krasny in Chicago. Uh -huh. And uh, we started to sort of explore the city a little bit more. <laughs> she brought me out of my small town shell. I hear you. I hear you on that. Uh, you, you know, my life is generally going to comic stores and bars as well. <laughs> even, even now, and I've been married for almost like 10 years. Um, so then at some point you moved to LA, am I right? Yeah. 2015. Yeah. Okay. So I stayed in Chicago for a long time teaching and performing mm -hmm. improv. And I also wrote uh, as a copywriter and advertising for a while to support, oh, cool. to support my family and have the, uh, the pleasures of health insurance. So uh, we did that for a while until I couldn't stomach writing another banner ad uh, uh -huh. again. And uh, we took off for LA in 2015. And then what, what was that secondary transition like from going from like, you're, all right, you're, you're, you're used to Chicago, you're used to a, a big city. Yes. And then you go to LA and like LA is like, uh, is like another planet. I always felt, you know, like LA and New York, I feel like are two just like weird diametrically opposite worlds revolving around earth, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I, I absolutely. It's uh, it, it was the transition out here was rough. Like I drove out here by myself first. I didn't have a job waiting for me. Mm -hmm. We didn't. Uh, we had really no 
contact out here, but uh, all the other performers I knew from Chicago who had been here. So we found a school district mm-hmm. that we wanted, uh, not a district, but a neighborhood we wanted our kids to go to elementary school in. And we found a tiny apartment uh, in uh, North Hollywood that we could live in uh, to get them into a good school. And we just crammed mm-hmm. ourselves into this little apartment for a couple of years uh, until uh, AP Bio took off and we were able mm-hmm. to sort of move on <laughs> up a little bit. So it's been uh, the biggest transition for me has been the heat. Like I can't mm-hmm. get used to uh, how hot it is all the time. Yeah, that's it. That seems like it sucks. I have friends in pa- <laughs> I got buddies in Pasadena, and you know, like a few in LA. And I'm, dude, like I'm with you on that. Like it's 82 degrees here right now uh, in Queens, and I'm in the air conditioning all day. I've, I don't want to go outside, you know, like I, I hear you. And my buddies are always like, dude, it's like a nice dry 97. I'm like, no, it's that stinks. <laughs> no yeah. And it's a dry 97 until Halloween, you know, I mean, right. <laughs> uh, buying my kids a uh, big Halloween costume so they can fit their winter coats underneath them. Now we've got to buy them like a little like swimsuits to wear. Cause it's so friggin' hot. It's so bananas. It's also very refreshing to see somebody, you know, like in the entertainment industry, who has had a lot of experience and you, you strike me as a, a very down to earth family man, you know, and I, I can definitely appreciate that. And I feel like that's a rarity. Oh, well, thanks. I have been in a lot of general meetings where they've said uh, it's uh, refreshing to meet someone not from New York or LA uh, or someone who's uh, normal, they say, which I take as an insult, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I I, I, lo- I I do love it. I do love like it's like uh, I hate using the term like small town sensibilities, mm-hmm. you know, uh, especially I guess like doing this and be doing podcasting for like like 10 years or whatever, you know, like you just don't meet people who care, you know, <laughs> I definitely have uh, small town roots and that it, those uh, really uh, inform my personality. And also it makes me like uh, uh, intimidated by uh, uh, like East Coast people like yourself. If you're talking really fast, mm-hmm. you'd be like, well, I'll just OK, I'll do what you say. You seem to know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I get that a lot. Like, <laughs> uh, dude, it's it's funny because like I, I even get that from my mother, too. Like sometimes she's <laughs> like, you talk very fast. Or um, we, I do another, I do a wrestling podcast also. And on occasion, some of the comments on our YouTube are like, these guys talk too fast, unsubscribe. (laughs) And I'm like, it's just, it's just like, I don't know. It's like that weird, like, you're almost like stuck in like the early (laughs) sixties, you know, like, like, what are you doing, pal? Like, what do you say? Let's, let's go get a coffee. Let's do all that shit. So I'll try to slow it down a little bit. A little smart to you there. Yeah, it's like it's just like a tiny bit. So, um, like I said, I discovered you on Hello from the Magic Tavern. Uh, it's see, like I, after listening to so many episodes, I'm like, oh, these guys are all like Chicago guys. Is that how you got hooked up onto that podcast? Yes, uh, Arnie, uh, Knee Camp, Matt Young, and Adel mm-hmm. Reply are those Magic Tavern guys, and uh, Arnie and Matt and I were all improv contemporaries at improv olympic we were all playing on herald teams there at the same time and adel was a little uh a little younger than us but by the time they formed magic tavern we'd all you know become one big society of uh uh, uh or subculture of improvisers in chicago mm. but uh yeah they started that podcast arnie had been one of the first people to ever do podcasts that i had ever heard of he oh, had wow. a couple before magic tavern uh, that I got to be on. Mm-hmm. One of them was called Stupid Nerd, where he just brought people in to talk to him about pop culture things that he didn't want to learn about <laughs> himself. Uh, so I got to go on and talk to him about the Hulk. And I think I did a Greed Lantern episode as well. Uh-huh. Uh, and then he also had one called Magic Cove or Mystery Cove, something like that, which was a fake companion podcast to a fake uh, Lost style TV show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh pretty good yeah and so he uh, i listened to that first episode of magic tavern and i went holy moly uh i can't wait till it's my turn to get in on this show uh-huh. uh, and as soon as i heard you know they uh arnie reached out to me and asked you know what sort of characters are you interested in playing he usually gives his guests the opportunity to pick their own people he lets them know sort of what they're looking for uh and i gave him a couple of ideas uh, but I also, but I said, I heard Matt mention Spintax mm-hmm. uh, as a rival wizard of his. And if I could be him, 
please, please, please let me let me come and be that character. And they did. And it's been such a blast ever since to play with those guys. It, it sounds like you have a lot of fun on the show. And plus, I, was it last year or, or 2019 that you had the Stitcher? Spin it was, uh, I think it was 2019 into 2020. I think our last episode was New Year's Day 2020. Okay. Yeah. 2020, just like off the, uh, off the calendar for, for most of us, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. So there's like that weird transition of like, uh, you know, like, oh yeah, that, that weird year. Um, yeah. so are, is there any, anything else coming from that? Like that, are you, do, are you going to do like another Stitcher series or is it just kind of like up in the air at this point? You know, we're just starting to talk about some of that. I don't know if I'll be doing that, uh, mm-hmm. with the Magic Tavern guys, if I'm going to start doing that, uh, uh, independently. Uh, because uh, Spintax is off on his own adventures, uh, or you know, they have a lot of spinoff series, and I'm not sure what uh, what the plans are going forward. But when, yeah, I'm starting to to generate some more uh, Spintax stuff. I know they've been working on a, a a bunch of cool projects. They're on hiatus right now. Um, I'm excited to see their new season launch. Yeah, they just wrapped up season three. Yeah, I'm I don't like, know oh. how they count their seasons. It's been like ten years. I think I think it's like a hundred episodes a season, which is which is hysterical. You know, I mean, like, I just go ahead. Oh, I just Arnie has a plan. That's what I know. He All has right, loose fine. plans, and I I have full faith in Arnie. That's awesome, man. Uh, and like your spin tax, uh, the Twitter account is hysterical, also, man. And that's like that's all you. Oh yeah, that was so fun. That started also mm-hmm. when we I moved to Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Um, I recorded my my maybe my second episode of Magic Tavern in Chicago, uh, and I said was saying I got taken off, uh, and I'm going to start this Twitter account. And they said go for it, uh, and I wrote a lot of his initial adventures in that Twitter account uh, while I was driving out to Los Angeles. I was just sort of uh, mapping mm-hmm. him going from Chicago. Uh, where he eventually ended up living in the Hollywood Hills uh, behind the one of the O's in the Hollywood sign with a pack of coyotes he tamed, (laughs) uh, which were all on hoverboards and lofted around by drones and things. But uh, so his travel sort of coincided with mine. uh, And I use that as inspiration to sort of uh, give him a, a good time. And now he's sort of gone through different phases of his online persona, just sort of having fun being an insane wizard online. Ah, uh, dude, it's so much fun. So, <laughs> so like, I want to, I want to kind of piggyback on something you said. You, you drove from Chicago to LA. Yeah, several how, times. How how was that? I I love driving, and yeah. like, I've never, I've only done like, I guess, like East Coast to Midwest or like East Coast to South. Like, how is that drive from Chicago to LA? Is it is it still flat, <laughs> or is it like, is there like a ton of stuff on, in the way? Well, that drive at the beginning when you're coming from Chicago is mm-hmm. very flat. We are going through, you know, Nebraska and uh, or Kansas or depending on the way that you go. But once you get uh-huh. over the Rockies, it turns into an alien landscape. You know, really? the Rockies feel like, uh, you know, danger to me. I'm, I'm from uh, an area of gently rolling hills uh-huh. at the most. And mountains are also terrifying. So uh, driving, especially during, uh, you know, uh, inclement weather, uh, through those mountain passes is very uh, high anxiety for me. Uh, but I'll tell you the only, and then you, I'm sorry, you get into Utah and it looks like another planet. Like you are driving on the surface of Mars or something. Uh, and it's just gorgeous. Uh, and you're going a hundred miles an hour and you don't see another car for an hour. Uh, it's insane. Uh, the, the only main difference is uh, if I'm driving with my family or if I'm driving alone, I've made the trip both ways Mm. and if i'm driving alone it is you know a calm and peaceful soul inspecting journey Uh and if it's with my family it is a nightmare uh because we have you know everyone is uh you know everyone just hates being cooped up in there for so long the kids are fighting we're fighting everyone's hungry and for different things at different times it's insane it does sound like a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, like we don't, we don't have kids yet, but like, you know, like I was, I was very pleasantly surprised that like, we didn't, we didn't try to chop each other's heads off on this last drive that we did, <laughs> you know? Um, so what do you, what do you, like, you're a creative guy, obviously, clearly. Uh, what are you into as far as like content, you know, like you mentioned that you are a comic book fan, which is pretty awesome. You know, like what else does it for you? Yeah. I'm a pretty uh, leisurely comic book fan. Um 
uh, uh, so I tend to read, uh, uh, you know, uh, way behind or I collect, you know, uh, I go back and read runs that are interesting to me. I'm not really keeping current on a lot of those things. Um, uh, I, I am very interested. I watch a lot of horror movies uh, right now. I'm getting mm. prepared for the Halloween season by getting into all of that stuff. And I've been revisiting uh, a list of movies that I compiled uh, of so in my small town. There is there was a small one theater, a uh, one screen theater called the Stanley Theater, uh-huh. and from like 1984 to 1995, I was there just about every Friday night to see whatever was playing, regardless of what it was. Mm-hmm. So I have this really eclectic collection of like 400 movies that I watched at that movie theater. Uh, like I saw Moonlighting when I was 12 in the theater or something like that. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> all these bizarre things and. Uh, so I've been slowly going back through those films and rewatching them uh, in our backyard, projected uh, onto a onto a screen. We have these outdoor movie nights where we're watching these movies as a series. Oh, that sounds like fun, man! Um, are yeah. they are those mainly horror movies or just like stuff that you saw? Like no, it's up? it's a wide variety. It's just it's a lot of like blockbuster movies from then. The the one that we watched most recently, uh, one of my favorites uh, from maybe a month ago, was uh, Outrageous Fortune with Shelley Long and Bette Midler. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's from like 1984, five, something like that. Uh, and it's it's sort of a midnight run type of on the, you know, uh, buddy comedy on the run. It's about two women who hate each other, who find out that they're sleeping with the same guy in their uh, acting class. And, uh-huh. uh, and he turns out to be a spy uh, and they get wrapped up in his whole uh, uh, intrigue. Uh, and it's hilarious. It's like 12 different movies in one. It sounds so familiar. I feel like I've seen that on like Channel 11 or something. Like I bet if you day. saw the poster, if you saw the poster, you would recognize it. It's an iconic poster of okay. Trey Long and Bette Midler hanging off of a cliff. Okay, yeah. So that that definitely rings a bell. And it's like, that's it's such an interesting era for movies too. Like my wife and I go back to that, like the 80s stuff, like a lot, especially during... Um, we kind of do the same thing when it's like spooky season. We've always just like compiled this list of like weird movies that we want to watch, you know? And last year, I think it was um, last year we were trying to make it through like as many Vincent Price movies as possible. Oh, nice. You know, and some of them are like, some of them are clunkers, but a lot <laughs> of them are pretty like for like that Halloween season. It's, it's yeah. pretty excellent, you know? And I love yeah. looking for like, um, stuff that I haven't ever seen that's been on like the periphery, you know? Yeah, well, last year on this time, my friend uh, Rich uh, put together a list of like 50 80s horror movies that he was gonna watch. I think he did on Letterboxd or something. Uh, and, uh, and I was like, I'm gonna watch those at the same time as you. And so we went mm-hmm. through these uh, 50 uh, amazing, a lot of them I'd seen, some of them I hadn't, uh, like Night of the Creeps, was one of the ones that I had never seen before that was just fantastic. Tom Akins is in it uh, and he's phenomenal. Uh, but uh, that was a blast and uh, I'm not sure what exactly, I'm, I don't have a theme for my horror movie uh, glut this year. I'm just gonna sort of dive in, I think. Yeah, I think that that's like, do you want like, uh, my wife and I talk about it all the time too. Is it like, are you in the mood for psychological horror, gore? Like, what's the deal? You know, like I've been watching like a lot of like, Eli, like rewatching like every Eli Roth movie. Oh know? yeah. <laughs> and like, they're I, I, like the Peacock thing. They're all on Peacock too, which is nuts. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like Hostel 1 and 2 and I think 3 is on there and uh, Green Inferno, which was, which I really liked. Um, well, Hostel was one that was that came out that was like the height of torture porn for me and that was like that was right when I started having kids and yeah. I took a break from horror I'd actually uh, I walked into Hostel mm-hmm. there's a video game movie called Blood Rain I don't yes, remember yeah. yes it was awful it's the only movie I've ever walked out of in my life uh, and like 10 minutes into it and I walked out of it and I'm like, I'm going to go to a different one. And I went to hostel and I also walked out of that one because just to walk into contextless <laughs> and minute in violence, I was like, this is awful. I'm out of here. Uh, so I never finished hostel and I took like a good five year break from horror. Uh, until I was like, could stop imagining my, my sweet little baby daughter. 
<laughs> every time I went to a, a horror movie. Is, you know, that's that's such an interesting thing that you say that, too, because I like I rewatched that. I rewatched it like a few weeks ago and I was like, oh, you know, when this came out, I really love this movie. Now I'm just kind of like a little bit turned off by it. You know, <laughs> I'm like, ah, you know, maybe it's because like, you know, like I'm getting like I just turned 40 and like, you know, we're trying to have kids and like all that stuff. And I'm just like, this is this is awful. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've gone full back into it as my kids have aged. And now I'm like, oh, I, I'm more into the the effects and the filmmaking of all of the horror again. And I can uh, enjoy it without having to be like, what sick people are watching? watching this <laughs> yeah 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 that's that's kind of funny too but i guess think like you know when you when you when you get that perspective again i think it does make you appreciate like i'm gonna use the exorcist as like an example you know yeah. like every time i watch that movie i get something new out of it just because filmatically there's something very gorgeous about that film you know yeah like whatever william friedkin did really stood the test of time you know, as opposed to like tons of other horror movies where you're kind of like, all right, this does not hold up, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Some of them are so iconic, even like, uh, you know, Halloween, the first Halloween that is maybe not perfect, but it is such the template for everything that came after. Uh, it, not just in horror, but it was, uh, it was an, just an important film on its own. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, like there's going to be, if, if there hasn't been already, I think there's going to be a lot of books written about John Carpenter, like within the next like 15 to 20 years, just because like his stuff is so, it's so layered, you know? Um, and I was, I was talking to my wife about this the other day about how like uh, the end of Escape from LA is very like topical right now. You know, you kind of wish that, I think like you, kind of, do you remember the end of Escape from LA? I don't, I haven't seen it since it came out. I watched that and John Carpenter's Vampires. Okay. <laughs> and then I was like, you know what? I'm not sure if he's still got this going on for me, but you'll have to remind me. Vampires is a weird one. So we were, we were, we were kind of talking about like, kind of like hating the internet, yeah. you know? And it's like, everybody's got their heads up their butts on Twitter and Facebook and all this stuff. And it's like a little too much sometimes. So I was like, you know, like that's basically the end of Escape from L.A. where Snake turns off the entire communications and like electricity on the planet with like the press of a button, oh. you know, and he sends the entire world back into like a quote unquote dark age where there is no communication and it's just people on their own, you know, Okay. Um, which I think, well, you know, I think that's fascinating. A little unibombery. It's a little unibombery. Yeah, for sure. But it's like, you know, I don't know, maybe me personally, I just kind of want to like get rid of the internet for at least a year. You know? <laughs> I mean, the unibomber wasn't all wrong. I mean, it was the bomb part that he was wrong about. The bomb part was the bad part about that <laughs> <Yeah>. guy's plan. <laughs> I have always said that. <laughs> the murderers of bomb plots. Yeah. Not, not good. Yeah. Um, all right, Charlie, I got a couple more questions for you and then sure. uh, we'll wrap it up, dude. Uh, what is the sandwich of your dreams? Oh, the sandwich of my dreams? Hmm, that's tough. I had a, a nice love affair with a, um, a Monte Cristo in my youth. That's a good sandwich. Uh, that's a good sandwich. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you can't go wrong with a good, you know, lately a peanut butter and jelly sandwich has been just great for me. You know, I've been, uh, we've been trying to make things as easy as possible at home where we do, uh, so we're not uh, serving four different meals to everybody. Mm -hmm. So we make one thing for everybody, uh, just like an old fashioned family. And uh, so I've had peanut butter and jelly back in my life for a while. And I'm like, I don't like that. I don't mind this at all. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Toasted yeah. bread or, 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 or not? Um, no, but if I have a toasted peanut butter and bacon sandwich, that's not bad. That sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. I used to have that when my parents would make BLTs when I was a kid. Uh -huh. I was like, I'm not eating lettuce or tomatoes or mayonnaise, uh, <laughs> peanut butter and bacon. That was it. <laughs> you can kind of put peanut butter and bacon on most things and it'll just be friggin' amazing. Yeah. I was trying to think of a way to get that into a, a, a burrito, work peanut butter into a breakfast burrito. Oh yeah, that could happen. I don't know about peanut butter and eggs though, but you know, I'll eat it. I try it. <laughs> if you get some uh, green chilies in there, you'll have a nice like uh, Thai flavor to it. That sounds yeah. You know what? You're right. That sounds pretty phenomenal. <laughs> uh, all right, Charlie. Where could everybody find you? And um, you know what? What do you want people to see? Oh sure. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at at the Kraken. Uh, 
which is, I guess, my handle. I guess I've never really promoted my Twitter before. Uh, it is <laughs> at the Kraken. Uh, I'm also Spintax the Green on Twitter. And uh, catch me on AP Bio season four, all four seasons streaming on Peacock now. Dude, thank you so much for coming on, man. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks a lot, Rich. Ooh, that was fun. I can't thank Charlie enough. What a good dude. I'd love to get a beer with that guy at some point. And I was very kind of blown out of the water that he graciously wanted to come on the show and chat with me, a total stranger, which is pretty cool. And that's kind of what this show's about, right? I want to do 100 creator interviews. Doesn't necessarily have to be comics. It could be from any sphere or world or planet. As long as you're a creative person and I dig your stuff, I will try to get you on the show. And I'm talking to you, Wesley Snipes. Listen, I got to get Blade on here. Otherwise, I won't rest. Guys, my books of the week. Nightwing, number 84. Continuing the Fear State storyline that's happening through the main Batman book, we get a beautifully written and illustrated issue of Nightwing where he has to go from Gotham from, I'm sorry, he has to go from Bloodhaven back to Gotham to see what's going on, trying to help people. Uh, the city is being overrun by this force called the Magistrate, which is being manipulated by the Scarecrow, who's trying to destroy Gotham so that they can evolve past fear. Very heady stuff, I know. And Oracle is no more. She starts. She basically goes full Batgirl in this issue. It's fantastic. Uh, this Nightwing run has been pretty phenomenal, and I suggest that you guys pick it up. I believe it restarted in issue 78 or 76. It's one of the, it's either one. Uh, my next favorite book of the week was Radiant Black number eight. Eight issues in, I'm starting to get really big time Invincible vibes. Uh, for those of you who haven't read Invincible, it's arguably top five, one of the greatest superhero comics ever put to print. I am not kidding about that. And I've been reading comics my entire life since before I was born, which is nuts when you think about it. Radiant Black is pretty fantastic. Kyle Higgins does a friggin' fantastic job. Uh, this book is out from Image. It's hard to explain in a nutshell what the book is about, but this issue continues the story of these cosmically powered super suits that have landed on earth that were the creation of like these mystical ancient alien beings and it's a story with a lot of heart because the first person that gets the radiant black suit kind of a down on his luck writer who has to move back home from his parent well, who has to move back home with his parents and it it it's a coming of age tale of people in their mid to late 30s which i really appreciate because, uh, oh, yeah, I'm past my 30s. I'm 40 now. So I still appreciate it. it. It's pretty cool. You know, like it really it really hits some of those notes of, uh, you know, just kind of like evolving and being a person. And then like now all of a sudden, you know, like they're these people are wrapped up in like this cosmic escapade. Pretty fantastic. Uh, and my book of the week is That Texas Blood, uh, number 10, out from Image by uh, Chris Condon and Jacob Phillips. Uh, Chris is a friend of the show. He's been on a couple of times. He was actually my first interview, so big shout out to Chris. Uh, real cool dude. I got to get Jacob on at some point soon. Uh, that Texas Blood, number 10. I cannot speak highly enough about this book. If you like true crime style, true detective style mysteries, this is for you. Uh, all these stories take place in Ambrose County, Texas, and this next story arc is... It's a bit of a flashback to late 70s, early 80s. You have Satanists, you have cults, you have kidnappings, you have murders. You have cops in the modern day trying to figure out what went wrong back then. This is a very dialogue rich issue. It's very meaty. It really pushes the story forward. I suggest that all of you guys pick up the first trade and um, subscribe to their Patreon also uh, on Twitter. I'll add a link to it in my in the in the show notes on YouTube, but really check them out, man, support them. Good, like independent creators, uh, solid dudes making a bang up book that I guarantee you will win a lot of awards next year. You know, as a comic fan, I feel like it's still like oddly, like kind of like it's a little bit undercurrent, you know, it's not a big two book. It's out from image. It's a very like stylized story, but, you know, if you're like me and you like just a plain old good story, you would love this book. Um, go check out Why the Last Man also on Hulu. If you have Hulu, uh, it seems like all the subscription services are now providing like providing everybody with like a little bit of superhero stuff here and there, which is pretty fantastic. Um, I love the comic. 
I think this series is going to do very well. I just want to see what happens. Why the Last Man is another book that kind of got it sneaked in under the rug, you know, and if you've read it, you know how great it is. If you haven't read it, I suggest to pick it up. Guys, next week, I'll be back with another interview. Uh, Dan Pinozian will be on the show with me. Another cool dude that I've been wanting to talk to forever. Um, amazing artist and creator. And he's writing a bunch now, too. So we get into that next week. And I want you guys to subscribe to this channel, BTC Rich X. Find me on Twitter at BTC Rich. I will answer all of your comic book questions if you have them. I hope you do. I love talking comics with people. Maybe more so than I like talking about wrestling with people. But I do love a good comic book. And I do love a good comic book conversation. So find me on there. And also, guess what, guys? It took 23 episodes for me to get my rear in gear. But we did it, folks. We are on iTunes. So please check out the audio version of this podcast on iTunes. If you don't want to look at my lumpy head, I don't blame you. If you want to just hear my silky smooth voice in your headphones, that's cool. Or on your speakers in your car, that's also cool. If you want to hire me to do GPS in your car, I will also do that too. Uh, go check it out on iTunes, uh, BTC uh, 2.0. I think it's under Behind the Counter 2.0. All the episodes are on there. Everything's logged. Please leave a five-star review if you can. If that's not too, not too much trouble, I'd appreciate it, guys. And with that, I will see you next week. Bye. I love you.